Hello, I'm Sensei Alex Kafio. Thank you for joining me this evening for meditation and sutra study. This evening's practice will consist of a 15 minute guided meditation, a reading from the Brahma's Night Sutra, followed by a Dharma talk. The title of today's Dharma talk will be Hold On to Your Attachments. Before we begin to that, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I post talks in the future. If you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, that'd be great too. So we'll begin this evening's meditation like we always do. I'll give you a moment to get into position. The only rule is you need to be comfortable. You need to be in a position that you can hold for at least 15 minutes without moving. If you'd like some instruction, what I like to do is sit cross-legged on the floor, back straight, slim chin slightly tucked, left hand, palm up, goes in the lap, right hand, palm up, goes over the left. And we begin very simply with the breath, breathing in and out through the nose. Breathing in this way, sends signals to our body that we're safe, that we can relax. allows a feeling of calm to come over us. And continuing with our breathing, with every inhale, we poke our belly by now and as if we just had a large meal. And on the exhale, we relax. In through the nose, belly button goes out. Relax on the exhale. And if we're wondering what to do with our thoughts, with the, every time we inhale and exhale through our nose, we simply focus on the physical sensations of our breathing. The air moving up and down our throats, the feeling of our belly expanding and contracting, the feeling of our clothing against our skin. And we'll just sit and breathe like this for about two minutes. I'll keep time. For mind wanders, we simply say hello to our thoughts and bring our focus back to the breath.
wonderful. Now we'll add a visualization to the meditative exercise. We'll visualize a fire burning in the space behind our belly button. This fire is our favorite color. We like blue, the fire is blue. We like red, the fire is red. And it burns like a campfire in the woods. This fire represents the enlightened nature that each of us possess. And now we're going to nourish our enlightenment with our breath. With every inhale, we breathe in through the nose, poking out our belly button, bringing air into our lungs. And with every exhale, we breathe out through the nose and visualize ourselves blowing on the base of the fire, just like we would a campfire in the woods, feeding it with oxygen, making it bigger and brighter with every breath. We breathe in, we fill our lungs with air. We breathe out and the fire expands. We'll do this for about a minute. I'll keep time. No need to worry about that. Good work. Everyone's sitting so silently and so still. It's a creating a great energy for the practice. Now we'll continue with our visualization by sending a channel of energy down from our belly, down, down, down to the center of the earth. And once we get there, we'll find an energy that's identical to our own. If the fire of our enlightenment is blue, the earth's energy is blue. If the fire of our enlightenment is red, the earth's energy is red. The Buddha, when he realized enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, Reach down and touch the earth for support. And now we'll do the same. With every inhale, we visualize energy coming up from the earth, up, 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 until it reaches our belly and mixes with our own spiritual power. And with every exhale, we'll continue to blow on that energy in our belly amplifying the fire of our enlightenment. We breathe in, energy comes up from the earth to our belly. We breathe out, we blow on that energy, amplifying it. We'll continue to breathe like this for about a minute. I'll keep time. And if our minds wander, that's okay. We simply say hello to our thoughts. 
and bring our focus back to our breath and the visualization. Great work. Keep breathing. Now what we're going to do is build on our visualization. We're going to send a second channel of energy up from the fire in our belly. Up, 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 past our solar plexus, past our throat, until it reaches the top of our head. So we have one channel of energy going from our belly down to the center of the earth. Another going from our belly to the top of our head. And as we continue to breathe in and out through the nose, on every inhale, we'll bring energy up from the earth, stored in our belly. And with every exhale, we'll push that energy up, 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 out of the top of our heads, like a volcano. We'll allow that spiritual power to cover every inch of our body in healing light. We've gone through so many trials and tribulations over the past week major and minor disappointments mixed in with major and minor joys. And now we'll simply nourish ourselves for a while, pulling that spiritual energy up from the earth with every inhale, storing it in our belly so it mixes with our own spiritual power. And then with every exhale, it goes up, 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 out the top of our heads, exploding like a volcano and raining down on our bodies, sending healing wherever it's needed. We'll breathe in this way for about a minute. I'll keep time. No need to worry about that.
wonderful. Great job, everyone. Now it's time to slowly bring our meditation to a close. And we'll start that process by closing off the energy channel and going to the top of our heads. Slowly the energy barely reaches our nose barely reaches our throat, barely reaches our solar plexus until it stops right there in our belly. And then we send our focus down to the earth. Perhaps we give a silent bow, thanking her for helping us in our practice, just like she did the Buddha 2,600 years ago. And then we close off that energy channel, noticing that even though the earth has fed us, she's not depleted. The more energy she gives, the more she has to give. Until finally, we stop where we started, with the fire of our enlightenment burning in our belly. We take a moment to notice that this energy is always there, that we can call upon it whenever we need it. But for now, we allow the visualization to fade and we come back into our bodies, moving our heads slowly to the left, then to the right. Feeling those physical sensations. Then we come back to center. And we roll our full shoulders forward. And back. No hurries, just feeling the muscles move. Feeling our clothing against our skin. And then we let our shoulders hang gently towards the floor. Now, if our eyes are closed, We'll open them, but only when we're ready. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. Thanks so much for doing that with me. <sighs> Meditation is a powerful practice, an important one. Sutra study is also important. So we'll begin that part of our practice now. This evening's reading will come from the Brahma Sat Sutra. We'll be continuing with this for about mm, two or three more weeks. This is the BDK English Tripitaka translation of the Brahma's Net Sutra. Not necessarily to have a copy, but if you'd like to follow along, it can be helpful. We'll be beginning today's reading on page 32, continuing our reading about the 10 grounds of wisdom. And yeah, number eight. The ground of the Buddha's roar of the essential nature. My disciples, 
When bodhisattvas enter the ground of the Buddha's roar of the essential nature, they enter into the samadhi of the stage of the Dharma king. Their accurate cognition is like that of the Buddha, since it is the Buddha's roar, samadhi. The ten kinds of eminently clear approaches of concentration are always directly accessible. With the sound of the flower radiance, one enters the mental state of samadhi. The term wisdom of emptiness refers to the approach of the wisdom of internal emptiness, the approach of the wisdom of external emptiness, the approach of the wisdom of the emptiness of the conditioned, the approach of the wisdom of the emptiness of the unconditioned, the approach of the wisdom of emptiness in nature, the approach of the wisdom of beginningless emptiness, the approach of the wisdom of emptiness as the ultimate truth, the approach of the wisdom of the emptiness of emptiness, the approach of the wisdom that the emptiness of emptiness is again empty, and the approach of the wisdom that the emptiness of emptiness is again empty of emptiness. These ten approaches to emptiness are not known in the lower grounds. The ground of space, like equality, is inexplicable inexplicable. It's there twice. The cognition of the way through supernormal power means that with one moment of cognition, one is able to know and discriminate all dharmas. Entering into innumerable Buddha lands, one requests elucidation of the dharma directly before each Buddha. One activates the dharma to save all sentient beings and in applying the medicine of the Dharma to all sentient beings, one serves as a great Dharma teacher and great spiritual guide. Obliterating the Four Maras With one's Dharma body complete, you continually manifest physically, entering into Buddha realms. Those in the category of Buddha and those in the category of the ninth and tenth grounds nourish their Dharma bodies. 100,000 Dharani entrances, 100,000 Samadhi entrances, 100,000 Admantine entrances, 100,000 entrances through supernormal powers, 100,000 liberation entrances. These are the same as these 100,000 entrances of space-like equality. The great unimpededness is exercised in one thought, in one instant. Kalpas are explained as non-kalpas. Non-kalpas are explained as kalpas. The non-way is explained as the way. The way is explained as the non-way. What are not the six destinies of sentient beings are explained as the six destinies of sentient beings. The six destinies of sentient beings are explained as not being the six destinies of sentient beings. Non-Buddhas are explained as Buddhas. Buddhas are explained as non-Buddhas. Yet entering and leaving the reflection within the samadhi of all Buddha essences, there is illumination of sequence and illumination of reversal. There is illumination of the prior and illumination of the latter. Illumination of causes and illumination of effects. Illumination of emptiness and illumination of existence the illumination of the cardinal truth of the middle way. This kind of cognition is only realized at the level of the eighth ground. It is not something that is attained at lower stages. One neither moves nor stops, neither leaves nor enters, is neither born nor extinguished. The qualities of the Dharma entrances at this ground are numberless, numberless, inexplicable, inexplicable. Now this brief opening of the contents of this ground is as are rare as one strand of hair among of a hundred thousand strands of hair on the head that has already been explained in the chapter on our hats. Number nine, the ground of the flower or ornamentation of the essence. My disciples, when bodhisattvas reach the ground of flower ornamentation of the essence, they use the Buddha's deportment in the Tathagata's royal concentration, where they have complete control over samadhi, entering and leaving regardless of the time. In the trichilocosms of the ten directions, 
10 billion suns and moons, 10 billion continents beneath the four heavens, in one instant they attain enlightenment, turn the wheel of the Dharma and pass through the other eight major junctures of the Buddha's career, up to entering into Nirvana. All Buddha works are manifested for all sentient beings through this one instant within one mind. All of their form bodies exhibit the eight minor and 32 major marks. They experience unimpeded enjoyment, they, the same as empty space. Brightly shining, their immeasurable great compassion adorned by their distinguished and fine marks. They are neither celestial nor human being, or nor human, nor any of the other types of beings of the six destinies. They are beyond all dharmas, yet always coursing through the six destinies, manifesting innumerable bodies, activities, innumerable verbal activities, and innumerable activities of thought in order to explain innumerable approaches to the dharma. And they are able to make the transition from Mara realms into Buddha realms, from Buddha realms into Mara realms. They are to make the transition from all views to enter into the Buddha view, and from the Buddha view to enter all views. From Buddha nature, they enter into the natures of sentient beings. And from the natures of sentient beings, they enter Buddha nature. This ground is lustrously illuminated from wisdom after wisdom shining, brightly burning, brightly burning. They are without fear and without limitation. The stage includes the 10 powers, the 18 distinctive abilities, liberation, nirvana, the purity of the unconditioned single path, and to all sentient beings they appear as father, mother, and elder and younger siblings, and expound the Dharma for them, exhausting all kalpas to attain realization of the path. They furthermore materialize in all lands and cause all sentient beings to see each other as their fathers and mothers, and to cause all Maras and non-Buddhists to see each other as their fathers and mothers. Abiding in this ground, they start off from the state of birth and death, arriving at the Admantine state. In the space of a single thought, they manifest this kind of activity and are able to transition themselves to enter the innumerable realms of sentient beings. This brief recapitulation of this kind of immeasurable activity is like a drop in the ocean. Number 10. The ground of entry into the Buddha realm of the essential nature. My disciples, when bodhisattvas enter the ground of the Buddha realm of the essential nature, their great wisdom is emptied. It is emptied and further emptied of emptiness, and again emptied like the nature of space, with the cognition of equality in nature and the possession of Tathagata nature. They are fully equipped with the ten kinds of merit, since emptiness has the same single mark, the essential nature is unconditioned, and spiritual transparency embodies oneness. Since the Dharma is the same as the Dharma nature, he is called the Thus Come One, Tathagata. One should accord with the Four Noble Truths and the Two Truths, exhausting the state of cyclic existence. Dharma nourishing and the Dharma body are not two. Thus he is called worthy of offerings. Pervasively covering all phenomena within all realms, correct cognition and holy liberative cognition know the existence or not of all dharmas, as well as the religious faculties of all sentient beings. Thus he is called correctly and peerlessly enlightened, Samyak Sambuddha. Luminous wisdom and practices are perfected at the stage of Buddhahood. Thus he is called perfected in wisdom and practice, Vidya Karana Samvana. Well gone in the Buddha Dharma of the three times. His Dharma is the same as that of past Buddhas. At the time of the past Buddha's departure, they did so well, did so well, and when they came, they did so well, did so well. Thus the name Well Gone, Sugata. His actions are the most virtuous and entering into society, he teaches sentient beings, leading them to liberation from all bonds. Thus he is called liberator of the world. 
This person, above all dharmas, enters into the Buddha's comportment with the appearance of a Buddha. The defining activity of a great person is that of liberating people from the world. Thus, he is called unsurpassed personage, Anuttara. He soothes all sentient beings who are called souls. Thus, he is called tamer of souls, Puru Sadamya Sarati. Amid gods and humans, he teaches all sentient beings so that they listen to the words of the Dharma. Thus, he is called teacher of humans and gods, Satya Deva Manus Yadam. The mystery and the source are not two. Buddha nature and profound awakening are always constantly greatly fulfilled. All sentient beings worship and respect him. Thus, he is called World Honored One. Since all the people of the world listen to and memorize the teachings, this is the Buddha stage. It is within this stage that all sages enter into their spheres of activity. Thus, it is called the stage of the Buddha realm. At this time, sitting on jeweled lotuses, all those in attendance received assurance of their future enlightenment and were overjoyed. As the Dharma body Buddha stroked their heads, bodhisattvas of the same views and learning with different mouths, yet in the same voice praised he who is without equal. Furthermore, all the Buddhas and bodhisattvas in the ten trillion worlds gathered like clouds, requesting the turning of the ineffable wheel of the Dharma. The Dharma approached with the guidance of Akasagarbha, this ground was that of the category of the inexplicable marvelous dharma approach, the marvelous samadhi approach of the three kinds of supernormal cognition, and the dharani approach, all of which are unknowable to the minds of ordinary people in the lower stages. Only the Buddha's immeasurable deeds, speech, and thought can fathom its source. As is explained in the chapter on the heaven of radiant sound, the ten forms of fearlessness and the Buddha path are the same. Wonderful. So, as I was pre preparing for this evening's talk and uh, reading through the, the grounds, eight through 10, I started thinking about emptiness, and I started thinking about the Bodhisattva path, and how that works in samsara, which we all know samsara in Buddhism is this world, and it is the world of suffering. And yet, as Buddhists, we don't strive to escape from the world. We are taught that this world is an illusion, and yet we spend a great deal of time figuring out the best way to live within that illusion to relieve suffering for ourselves and for other people. And the reason we're told that the world is an illusion is because the world is constantly changing. Nothing is permanent, nothing is separate. Our human bodies, for example, are of the nature to be born, to grow old, to get sick, and to die. This is true of everyone. There's nothing we can do to change that. And yet, we want our bodies to remain the same. We want to remain young, we want to remain healthy. We want our mental cognition to never go away. But that's not how the world works. So this world is an illusion, but it's an illusion we have to live in. Just like even though our body is constantly changing, we have to live in our body. We don't have a choice. And that tension can be the source of great suffering. 
it gives birth to the three poisons, which in Buddhism we call greed, anger, and ignorance. We're greedy because we want things to remain the same. We're angry or we experience aversion because things don't change the way we want them to. And we are ignorant of the fact that the world is constantly changing, whether we want it to or not. And because of this, everything in the world is very strange because it is either a source of suffering or it's a source of joy. Generally speaking, it's a source of both at different times. Uh, you can take purchasing a car, for example. Most people, when they purchase a car for the first time, it's a happy occasion. It's a sense of freedom, a sense of responsibility. Now we can go places without asking other people for permission or for a ride. But at the same time, a car, like our bodies, are constantly changing and cars come with responsibilities. We have to get a license and we have to keep it up to date. We have to get insurance, which can be expensive. We have to get it registered and get our license plate renewed. We have to get it gas on a regular basis. We have to get the oil changed. And even as we do all of that, no matter how well we take care of the car, eventually it's going to break down. So then we have to pay money to get it fixed. But eventually it'll break down to the point where it can't be repaired. And we have to get another car. Now, this doesn't mean that cars are bad. It simply means that cars come with responsibilities. There's joy associated with the purchase of a car. There's also suffering associated with the purchase of a car. It's the same with everything in life. Whether it's our body, whether it's a home, whether it's a yard, house plants, pets, we always have that give and take. Things change in ways we want, but they also change in ways we don't want. Things stay the same for a while like we want them to. Sometimes things stay the same when we don't want them to. Give and take. Constantly. And this can create a lot of turmoil in our minds. So in Buddhism, we are taught something called non-attachment. And what non-attachment is, is learning and being willing to let go of the things that cause us harm. Long story short, we have to figure out, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is this thing I'm bringing into my life with the assumption that it'll cause me some joy, some pleasure, it'll ease my life in some way, is that worth the pain that it will also inevitably cause me? Is the joy of driving a car worth the annoyance that comes with having to get gas? And maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. With a few exceptions, Buddhism doesn't tell us what to think in that regard, but it does uh, invite us to investigate. And that's important because usually we are so caught up in the cycle of samsara, so caught up in trying to hold on to the things we want and get away from the things we don't want that we don't do that investigation. We just kind of go with the flow. We just do whatever feels good in the moment and just give in to whatever emotions, whether good or afflictive, that we have. And there's lots of examples of this. I can think of my own life. When I was in my early 20s, I drank quite heavily, uh, lots of alcohol. And it's interesting because I never liked the taste of alcohol. Never liked beer, never liked wine, didn't like vodka. And on top of that, I always got these really terrible hangovers afterwards. So we'd go out for a night of drinking. I'd come home, sleep it off, wake up, and 
would feel like little green men were banging the inside of my head with a hammer. But it never occurred to me, at least then at least, that if someone offered me a beer, I could say, no thank you. Because I was so caught up in the moment that I was just going with the flow. There was no investigation. I just did what felt good in the moment without thought to the hangover that would come later. Social media is another example. A lot of times we're on social media just because everyone else is on social media. And when people post things on social media, sometimes there are things we like, sometimes there are things we don't like. And when I first started off, I'm old enough to remember life before social media, before the internet. And, you know, back when Facebook was solely for college students, even way back then. And what's interesting about social media is that we don't always realize the fact that we don't have to argue with people on the internet. If someone types something we don't like, we can just not respond. <laughs> and we don't think of that because, again, we're not doing that investigation. We're not thinking through our actions. We're asking ourselves, is the juice worth the squeeze? Instead, we're just going with the flow. Right? So what Buddhism teaches with non-attachment, it's not detachment. We don't completely get away rid of everything, but we investigate things individually and figure out, well, maybe this is causing me harm so much, in fact, that it's not worth it. And I'm just going to get rid of it completely. This is what happened with me and alcohol. When I investigated my relationship with alcohol and with drinking, I realized I was spending a lot of money. In some cases, I was ru ruining relationships, but I honestly wasn't getting that much enjoyment out of it. So I stopped drinking. And my life became a lot calmer and a lot quieter as a result. When it comes to social media, I went through a phase where I had no social media at all. No Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram. And it was very peaceful. I enjoyed it quite a bit. But I also started to lose track of people because everyone's on social media now. So family, I miss out on family events because no one would tell me about it. It's like, well, we, we put it up. There was an invite on Facebook. It's like, but I don't have a Facebook. <laughs> and now, of course, I'm offering teachings online via YouTube and my blog and Twitter, etc. So social media, as much of a dumpster fire as it is at times, isn't something I can get rid of completely. It's an attachment, but it's attachment I can't let go of. So doing the investigation, realizing that there is some good that comes out of this, I can't let go of it. Instead, I have to learn how to work with it skillfully. And this is a dance, this is an investigation that all of us do through our practice. Figuring out what we can let go of, figuring out what we can't let go of, and the things we choose to hold on to and I can't tell you what those things are. You need to figure that out for yourself. But if we choose to hold on to something, whether it's a social media account, whether it's a significant other, whether it's a job, from the Buddhist view, the next question we need to ask ourselves is, how do I work with this thing skillfully? I've cut through all the fat. I've cut through all the meat. I'm down to the bone. I cannot let go of anything else. Maybe I just don't want to let go of anything else. So what do we do now? And this is the practice of emptiness. It's the practice of non-attachment. Sometimes when people think of emptiness, they think that the idea is that we move so far away from the world that nothing touches us that we're not connected to anything, that we're not supposed to have emotions or thoughts or dreams. And that's not correct. We know this from this, the sutra, which tells us that we must be emptied 
of emptiness. That dharma nourishing is not different from the dharma body. In other words, if we practice Buddhism in daily life, we are becoming one with the Buddha. Both the celestial Buddha and the Buddha within ourselves. So the goal then is to let go of the attachments that take us away from our Buddha nature, the ones that are unhealthy, the ones that are just so damaging that, like I said, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. But once we figure out the things that we are going to hold on to, the attachments that are healthy, the attachments that are life affirming, we treat those things like they're sacred. We care for them. We incorporate them into our Buddhist practice. To take a, a normal example, we can look at our car. Now, a car is neither good nor bad. It's just neutral. But if we decide we're going to have a car in our lives, the only logical thing to do is to what? To take care of that car. It's already going to cause us some suffering. It's going to break down. We're going to have to get gas for it, oil changes, rotate the tires, etc. But we can choose to not compound that suffering by caring for our vehicle, by taking it in for all those checks that the manual requires of us, by getting the good gas, by you know, getting the inside details. So that we can minimize the suffering associated with our car and we can maximize the joy that comes from it. Buddhist sutras are another excellent example. Brad Warner actually did a talk earlier today over on his channel where he says that we should not put the sutras on the ground. And th this is a teaching in Buddhism because the sutras are sacred. They're a sacred text. Um, they're the teachings of the Buddha, of the patriarchs and matriarchs that came after him. And we need to care for the sutras. Why? Because we can't learn Buddhism without them. Now, sure, we might say it's just a book. It's just a bunch of paper tied together. And that's true in one respect. But if we've decided we're going to study the sutras, that we're going to do this thing called Buddhism, that we are going to practice the way, why would we not treat the sutras like they're sacred? Why not, would we not treat them with care and with respect? That's why you can't see it from where you are, but I have this handkerchief that I place on the floor next to me so when I'm done reading the sutra, I place it on the handkerchief so it doesn't touch the floor. It's a small thing. No one's in the meditation hall at the moment but me. So no one would know if I did that but me. But what I find is that if I treat the sutras like they're sacred, if I treat my houseplants like they're sacred, I water them, I ensure they have the appropriate levels of sunlight, then I have an easier time treating people like they're sacred. My family, my friends, my loved ones, I care for them just like I care for the sutra, just like I care for my plants. And as we care for our attachments, as we care for those things that we've chosen to keep in our lives, they bring more joy to our lives and less suffering. Just like a car, that if we take care of it, it breaks down less often. Just like our bodies, if we feed them and clothe them and ensure we get plenty of rest, they get sick less often. Eventually they will get sick. Eventually I will die and my body will go back into the earth, but I can push that time off a little bit. I can increase the quality of my life by treating my body as if it were sacred. Attachment isn't a problem if we are attached to things that are healthy and that are life affirming.
Take the example of food. I would say that it's a positive and good thing to be attached to eating healthy food. Which isn't to say that you're a bad person if you eat a cookie or that we should be so intent on eating healthily that you know it becomes neurotic, but if our focus is on, I'm gonna eat food that's nourishing to my body. I'm gonna eat my fruits and vegetables like the health teacher said I needed to do in school. There's no problem with that. We don't need to eat junk food just to prove how spiritual we are. We don't have to disrespect the sutras. We don't have to let our house become filthy and unlivable to show how unattached we are. Quite the opposite. We prove our non-attachment by caring for these things, by showing that we're not scared of the fact that eventually they're going to go away. Eventually my body will betray me. It will get sick and it will die. That's a fact. Now I can respond to that one of two ways. I can be greedy and be neurotic about it and worry about my oncoming death and really get down about it, get depressed. Or I can practice anger and aversion and, well, if my body is going to die anyway, I just won't feed it. I just won't clothe it. I just won't get enough rest because who cares? It's going to leave me anyway. That's not the Buddhist practice. The Buddhist practice is, I'm going to lose this thing, but I'm going to care for it anyway. The sutra will eventually end up in the recycling bin. I won't put it there, but someone will probably after I die. But for the time being, when I'm done reading it, it'll go on a handkerchief. My plants, my house plants, will all eventually shrivel up and die. But in the meantime, I'm going to water them and fertilize them once a month. This is the practice of non-attachment. We accept that things are going to go away and we treat them well anyway. We, ex we are respective or respectful, I should say, both of the emptiness of their nature and the inherent Buddha quality of their nature at the same time. We hold our life with empty hands, meaning that we don't grasp onto things and we don't push them away. And at the same time, we use both hands. I wonder what our lives would be like if we lived them with both hands. If for the things that are healthy, the things that are life affirming, and or the things that we just can't get away from, like our bodies, like our jobs, what if we just leaned into them wholeheartedly? This thing is here, I'm going to take care of it. When I walk into the meditation hall, I bow. No one knows I do it but me. When I give these talks, the suture goes on the handkerchief. No one knows I do it but me. But when we understand that our minds and our bodies are not separate, that what we do with our bodies affect our minds and what we do with our minds affect our bodies, when we use our bodies to treat every aspect of our life like it's a sacred thing, whether it's cutting the grass or walking the dog or doing the dishes, our minds become attuned, become trained to not only look for the sacred in daily life, but to give it greater respect. And it becomes a very healthy, very virtuous cycle. We treat the objects in our life like they're sacred, so they treat us like we are sacred. We take care of the car, so it doesn't break down. We take care of our bodies so we don't get sick. 
and we create joy for both ourselves and for others. Once we go so deep into emptiness that we come out the other side, we realize that there is no separation between the absolute world and the conventional world. That there's no separation between the Buddha and our daily life. And in doing so, we are able to find divinity in the mundane. Amitabha. So, that's the talk for today. I hope it was helpful. We'll just end with a few announcements. So, this was Meditation and Sutra Study. We do it every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Broadcast here from this channel. So, please make sure to subscribe and hit the like button if you'd like to join us in the future. We also do Dharma Sunday every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. Also broadcast from this channel. And that's a little less involved. We just do a reading from a topic from the news or pop culture, and then I follow up with the Dharma talk, giving the Buddhist perspective on that thing. So I hope to see you there. Until next time, Amitabha.